Forgiveness is a process, it's not something that you can rush and it's not a process you should seek to avoid. When we do that, we end up in a place of toxic forgiveness. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Soul Work Podcast with myself, Ify Alexis Lee. Over here we are about prioritising what matters the most but unfortunately is often overlooked and that is the soul work. The soul work is made evident in our character as well as our choices. It's vital, it's essential, but over here we do the soul work together. On today's episode, I want to speak about toxic forgiveness and letting go of offence. Forgiveness is something that comes up a lot in my work as a therapist, naturally, right? I find that depending on our level of faith, our doctrinal upbringing or the denominations that we're a part of, we can often have varying views on forgiveness. Forgiveness is a biblical principle. It's something that we see throughout the whole of scripture. But I think culture and tradition sometimes plays a role in how we interpret what forgiveness actually is. So through this episode, I plan on taking you through a journey of what forgiveness is, what forgiveness isn't, toxic forgiveness, and really giving you tools as well as an understanding on ways to move past offence. So firstly, forgiveness is an internal process. It's the internal process of letting go of resentment or the need to revenge someone who has wronged you. So there needs to be a wrong for there to be forgiveness. Forgiveness is a personal choice. It is not dependent on the actions of others. It is not dependent on external factors such as whether the person is alive or whether or not you've received an apology. I think it's important to say that forgiveness is not condoning what happened to you. Sometimes we conflate the two. We think that in order to forgive, we need to condone what happened or we need to minimize what happened. Forgiveness is not minimizing what happened neither. Forgiveness has its eyes wide open to the fact that there has been a wrong, there's been a breach, something has happened that should not have happened. And it is from that place that we forgive. I think this is important because what some of us put in place in order to forgive is often spiritual bypassing or emotional bypassing, emotional gaslighting if you will. We tell ourselves that what happened wasn't that deep, it wasn't that important, perhaps it didn't hurt that much, it's not that big a deal, I can get over it. And this is the narrative we tell ourselves in order to coerce or cajole ourselves into forgiving. But no, forgiveness doesn't minimise what happened. Forgiveness doesn't minimise the ramifications of what happened. Forgiveness sees it with two eyes and says, I'm choosing to let go of the resentment that's attached to what's happened. And I'm choosing to remove myself from the need for revenge. Another thing that forgiveness is not, forgiveness is not removing the consequences of the wrong. Consequences can still remain even if forgiveness is granted. So in the case of someone that has experienced, for example, sexual abuse, you can reach a place of forgiveness, but that doesn't absolve the person of the need to go to jail, for example, and face the consequences of what they've done wrong. Forgiveness is not forgetting, and I know that there's that popular phrase, (laughs) forgive and forget. Um, It's been quoted so much that many of us think it's in the Bible, but it's not. Um, But forgiveness isn't forgetting, it is not erasing the memory of what happened. We have a memory for a reason, our hippocampus works for a reason, we have working memory for a reason. And so yes, over time the effects of what's happened starts to loosen its hold on us, it doesn't hurt as deeply as it used to hurt, but it is not forgetting that it happened. So if your memory still works and you remember the wrong, that's not necessarily a sign that you haven't forgiven. Sometimes the ways in which we speak about forgiveness can be really damaging, right? I think that there is this bully mechanism that sometimes takes place when it comes to forgiveness. We dangle words like forgiveness and repentance and move on with it or restoration very, very quickly and we don't realise that there's a process to a lot of these things. I've had clients come into the therapy room who have experienced all kinds of trauma and when discussing how they've been handled, 
one of the things that typically comes up is that they've been told, just forgive the abuser, just forgive the person that hurt you, just forgive them and you'll get over it. And a lot of them are left disillusioned when they're struggling to do just that. Forgiveness is indeed a process, but it's not something that can be rushed. Forgiveness is a process and it often goes hand in hand with healing. As we heal from the effects of what has happened, we become better placed to forgive the person who did the wrong. God isn't just committed to us forgiving them, but he's also committed to healing us. The Bible says that he's close to the brokenhearted. And actually from that place, we even gain the perspective and the heart to forgive properly. Some of us hold on to forgiveness because honestly, it feels like a power play. You know, if I let go of the ill feelings that I have associated with this person, then this person gets to walk scot-free. I've been there. Sometimes holding on to unforgiveness feels like the just thing to do. Because in many ways, forgiveness doesn't feel just. Romans chapter 12, verse 19, it says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And so there's something, especially in the process of Christian forgiveness, where, yes, we are stepping out of the way. Yes, we are choosing to deal with the inner resentments and the inner feelings that we have towards this person or what it is that they've done. But what we are really doing is stepping out of the way so God can be the judge. And he is a perfect judge. He is a righteous judge and he weighs the scales perfectly more perfectly than we ever could and so there's something powerful in forgiveness that really says okay god your turn you've seen what's happened to me you've seen what's gone on i'm leaving it to you to settle the score so let's talk a little bit more about what forgiveness really is forgiveness is letting go of control it's letting go of the need to control the outcomes. When we are in unforgiveness, when we are struggling with forgiveness, it's oftentimes because we're trying to control. Make no mistake, forgiveness works hand in hand with boundaries, but it's letting go of the need to control a situation and really making space for God to do just that. Forgiveness, as I mentioned, is letting go of judgment. It is taking yourself out of the judgment seat, taking yourself out of that seat and allowing God to sit in that judgment seat and to exact his judgment upon the person that's hurt you. Forgiveness is freeing ourselves. I'm sure you've heard the popular quote that unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. There is something so profound in how forgiveness works that it helps us to move forward. We're no longer seeking to control. We're no longer hyper aware or hyper fixated on what has happened to us, but we're now in a position where we can be free from the need for the other person to suffer. Forgiveness in a way is empowering ourselves. It is taking control back of our emotions. If you've ever been in the place of unforgiveness, I definitely have. It can feel as though our hearts are outside of our chest, right? How comes this person's still smiling? How comes they're still getting a promotion? Whatever the case is, we are constantly moved emotionally based on something external. Forgiveness in a way is bringing back that control to ourselves and empowering ourselves. And because of that, forgiveness is emotional independence, not allowing others to dictate how we feel or having power over our emotions. So back to toxic forgiveness. What comes up a lot in therapy is almost like a, a demonization of anger and offense. We treat these things as if they are so taboo, like having an offense or being offended is the end of our Christian faith or our, our spiritual maturity. And I have a different view on this, so walk with me. Whilst I do believe someone who is very, very easily angered and someone who is easily irritable, someone who is easily offended, hasn't been perfected in love as we read in scripture because love isn't easily irritated. They are someone that has some maturing to do in terms of their emotional triggers. I think the goal should never be to never ever be angry or to never ever have offense. 
Anger is an emotion just like every other emotion. We see Jesus in the temple flipping tables because he has this holy anger regarding these people that are, are, are buying and selling in the house of the Lord. It shouldn't be that way. Anger follows a violation. Anger follows where there is a, a sense of worth or value that has been diminished. Protect your anger. If something really bad happened to someone that you love, a natural emotion would be anger. I have two daughters and if something happened to one of them, I would feel offended and I would feel angry. This is part of the natural range of emotion that God has given to us. The Bible says, be angry. Do not sin, but be angry. It's okay to be angry. And Jesus models that. I think some of us in our understanding of anger and offense might even think that we're holier than God, who says to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan, who refers to the Pharisees as whitewashed tombs, someone who exercised wisdom, but wasn't afraid to be honest with how he felt and what the truth of the matter was. So anger and offence aren't inherently wrong. What we do with them, how it manifests, how long we hold on to it is where some of the technicalities can arise. The Bible says anger leaves a foothold for the devil. And so the goal is not to be angry continuously, but to process it, to work through it, to move through it, to metabolise it ultimately. So perhaps you've heard it said that we should be unoffendable. I've heard it said, and I think the people that say it often are well-meaning, but Jesus himself wasn't unoffendable. Actually, sin is an offence to a holy and a righteous and a perfect God. And whilst our goal, as I mentioned, isn't to be offended by every little thing that pops up, it's okay to acknowledge that you felt offended. If someone cut your ponytail, I would hope you would feel a sense of offence. If someone took credit for your ideas at work, I would hope you would feel offended. If someone slapped your child, I would hope you would feel offended. These emotions are there to encourage us to take action. And for many of us, those actions look like setting up boundaries. Toxic forgiveness says that regardless of what happens, just forgive them, move on. It's okay. It's not that deep. But no, when Jesus went to pray and his soul was deeply grieved in the Garden of Gethsemane and he came back and found his disciples, his loved ones sleeping and he's saying, could you not tarry with me one hour? He goes, comes back, says the same thing because they've fallen asleep again three times. I want you to understand that he's conveying an emotion, a strong emotion in this time. There is nothing wrong with being angry. How you're angry is what matters, okay? Forgiveness is not performance-based. I think for many of us, in an attempt to judge a tree by its fruit, we often look at the performance to know if someone has forgiven someone. And so what this can look like sometimes is, well, if you've forgiven them, you should allow them back in your space. Well, if you've forgiven them, how come you're not friends with them anymore? Well, if you've forgiven them, why don't you send them some money? But forgiveness is an internal process. It's free from external validation. It shouldn't be about what it will look like, but it should be about what it actually is in your heart. I say that to say forgiveness doesn't always have to equal reconciliation. It takes one person to forgive, but it takes two people to be reconciled. The Bible says in Amos 3.3, can two walk together unless they are agreed? They can't. So for there to be a reconciliation, there has to not just be forgiveness, which is letting go of the resentment associated with the other person's wrong, but it also includes the other person being able to own their wrong, repent for their wrong. And remember that repentance, the Greek word metanoia, means to have a change of heart, to have a change of mind, to see things differently. And so there are cases in our journeys where I've forgiven a person, but I'm no longer walking as closely with that person. You've forgiven that person. You have greater wisdom and discernment with how to handle them. There are boundaries that you've put in place as a result of what happened. I must also say that the opposite can be true as well. 
you can do all the things. And I think this is where the performance driven mindset comes into play. You can perform like you love, let's say your parents, you are doing all the things, right? You are sending money, you are cooking, you are cleaning, you are whatever it is. And in your heart, you know that you are harboring lots of deep rooted resentment and bitterness towards the person. Forgiveness isn't about performance. It's about the state of your heart. So a boundary is the invisible line that we put in place in order to protect ourselves, to protect our emotional well-being and distinguish our personal limits, what you will and what you will not tolerate in the relationships that you're in. Of course, every relationship can look different and depending on the relationship, setting boundaries can be a precarious act. It requires a lot of human engineering. Sometimes boundaries need to be reinforced, they need to be reinstated, they need to be repeated continuously. But a boundary always needs a consequence for it to actually be a boundary. And that makes me think, if this person doesn't change, if there isn't repentance, if there isn't a change of heart or change of mind, you have to change how you interact. You have to change some of the, the space and the ground that you've given to them. So I mentioned at the start that forgiveness follows healing. There is something about being able to process and work through what you've been through that puts you in a better place to reach forgiveness. And oftentimes we throw forgiveness out as if it's the first thing to do. But how can you forgive what you don't yet know? How can I forgive the depths that I haven't yet seen? Essentially what we're normalizing is a shallow form of forgiveness. It's a forgiveness that ultimately is self-betrayal. It's a forgiveness that isn't linked and rooted in a sense of worth for yourself, but in bypassing yourself. So what can this actually look like in the therapy room? I don't lead with forgiveness, but as a Christian, I understand the importance of forgiveness. And so forgiveness is something that we come to. Forgiveness is when the client sees that, okay, this is becoming maladaptive for me to hold on to the need to control everything around me, hold on to this power move that I feel like I have, hold on to the hurt and the pain that I'm feeling. And so as we work through the journeys of healing through various intervention techniques, letting it go, processing what's happened, we eventually very, very naturally reach this space of, I don't wanna carry this anymore, I wanna forgive. The client in the previous episode that I did on inner child work, the client with whom I did the God in the Room exercise, if you can remember, if you haven't watched that video, watch that video. But she speaks about when I asked where was God when this was happening, this was a form of abuse that happened to her. And she said that God was right there kneeling in front of me crying. It took us some time in our therapy room for her to realize God wasn't just weeping for me but he was also weeping for my abuser. Because not only has it set me on a path that hasn't been easy, but it also set my abuser, her abuser, into a path that led them further away from God and deeper into sin. It takes us a while, often time, to reach that place of perspective. And although important and necessary in the healing journey, because they go hand in hand, it's not something that can be rushed. So a few practical ways of letting go of offence. The first thing is to not be afraid to approach the healing work. Don't be afraid to really step into the place of processing exactly what happened, how it made you feel, what it took from you, what it robbed from you, what your life would be like if it never happened. There's a sense of grief that needs to happen and the emotions associated with that. It can feel like anger, it can feel like pain, it can feel like upset. It can feel like disappointment. Whatever the case is, don't be afraid to wrestle. Don't be afraid to do the healing work, the soul work of really getting to the core of how what happened hurt you. And so for the person that's experienced friendship betrayal, you might reflect and look back and realize, wow, that betrayal has really left me feeling like I'm not good enough. That betrayal has made me second guess my thoughts, second guess who I am as a person because it happened. Process that, sit with that, work through that. The second thing I'll say when it comes to working through offense, in a lot of situations, not all situations, but sometimes there's shared responsibility, to be very frank. 
yes, the person really hurt you, but it's it's also likely that you also shared some part in the hurt. You shared some part in allowing them to hurt you or you to hurt the other person. Whatever that is, my second point is about personal responsibility and accountability. Sometimes we need to reflect on our own actions or inactions and how we contributed to what happened. As I say this, I encourage you to do this tenderly. Your contribution to what happened doesn't necessarily mean that it was all your fault and isn't licensed for you to just blame yourself. In many situations, regardless of what you did or didn't do, the act against you was so violent, was so disproportionate that it just is not your fault. The third point in terms of letting go of offence is communication. Healthy communication where necessary, where possible. And this can look like really approaching the person that hurt you. Matthew 18 speaks about this. It says if you have an offence against someone, go and meet them. Have a conversation. If you are able to win them back, then you've won back a brother. You know, the Bible then escalates it. Take someone from the, from the community. Take an elder. Essentially, sometimes we are trying to heal wounds that just require a conversation, a conversation of perspective, a conversation of intent. Um, And intent doesn't minimize impact, but sometimes it can help us see that person's heart more clearly. And that in and of itself brings about immense healing. I think the fifth thing is just as we grow in our walk with God, I think there is something to be said about I think the scriptures put it this way that for him who has been forgiven much they love much there is something about being aware of your need for saving your need for Jesus that places you in a better position to extend loving kindness and tender mercies to those who wrong you and so a part of how we let go of offense is growing in our walk with God and praying for God to sensitize our hearts to just how much he loves us, just how much he loves the other person and really praying that we accept God's forgiveness and extend that to others. Lastly, I would say really get busy in other areas of your life. Offence can feel so all-consuming, yeah? And whilst we can make a decision to say, I want to forgive this person, I want to release the offence because forgiveness is, is a decision, right? Sometimes we just don't feel it immediately. And sometimes we can still feel overwhelmed with the feelings of offence and hurt and pain. Try to focus your energy in other places. Try to think about other areas of your life. Yes, this relationship did not work out how you thought it would work out. Yes, you've been hurt by this relationship. Assuming you're doing the healing work and you're going through the process of processing it and all of that stuff, don't be afraid to prioritise other things. Don't let your physical health suffer as a result of it. Get out there, have a walk, get some sunlight, get some vitamin D, um, throw yourself into work. Don't forget to prioritise the other things around you that really matter. Make sure you're eating, drink your water, do your skincare routine so your face doesn't have to suffer. Whatever the case might be, get into the journaling, read the word of God, make sure you're taking care of yourself and not just zoning in to this one area of offense that you're feeling. So forgiveness is a process. Oftentimes when we rush the process, we find ourselves in the land of toxic forgiveness. When we avoid the process, we find ourselves in toxic forgiveness. The goal is not to rush it or to avoid it. The goal is to go on that process of healing, go on that process of working through it and ultimately reach the other end of letting go of the resentment, letting go of the bitterness, and making space for God to really enact his judgment on the situation, and allowing God to give you his perspective on the situation. Thank you guys so much for watching. I pray that this episode was an absolute blessing to you. Please share it with a friend, and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Lots of love.